here is Tiki Fullerton on Your Money. Hello there, I'm Tiki Fullerton every night bringing you a full hour of the very best in business coverage across the nation and internationally, especially where business and politics meet. Coming up, tensions in our Pacific region and defence top of mind, our exclusive TV interview with Sir Roger Carr, chairman of BAE Systems Globally, using Canberra to mark 65 years of BAE in Australia and check up on his $35 billion future frigate project. Buy now, pay later has been in the sights of regulator ASIC. We talked to Afterpay co-founder Anthony Eisen after the company's AGM about investing in the business and what he makes of ASIC's report and intentions around the sector. And the government in crisis mode with Treasurer Josh Frydenberg electing to stay home rather than travel to Argentina for G20. We catch up in Canberra with Sky News reporter James O'Doherty and get the latest insights on the G20 trade meeting between Donald Trump and Xi Jinping with trade expert Alan Oxley. Now, as Australians, we might be preoccupied with the clear and present danger of terrorism on our streets. But on the broader defence front, there's a great deal going on in our region, and in particular, the rising tensions in the Pacific. Some might say that Australia has been a bit of a boil frog on all this, while China has moved in with a wave of soft power to island nations like Vanuatu. Indeed, China has now signed up MOUs on its Belt and Road with, well, Vanuatu, Fiji, Samoa, PG, uh, Tonga, uh, and even Victoria. <laughs> in return, Australia is now to build a naval base on Manus Island. It's uh, delivering an electricity project too with Japan and the US and New Zealand for PNG. But all this increased tension reminds us of just how important the right defence force is for Australia and the importance of an indigenous defence force with big projects built here. The government is now committed to its 2% of GDP for defence and we're also hearing this phrase sovereign capability which means that big defence projects now not only have to fulfil the military requirements but also connect with domestic supply chains and deliver jobs here in Australia. Well, it's a jolly good era for the defence industry, of course, especially those that win mandates. Take BAE Systems, which won the recent Hunter Class Frigate Build, a $35 billion project this year, which will be based largely in South Australia. Well, also this year is BAE's 65th birthday in Australia. The com company tracks back its operations right back to uh, uh, the testing of missiles at Woomera in the 50s all the way through to the Type 26 Hunters I was talking about and indeed being part of the build and the servicing here of the F-35 Joint Strike Fighters, two of which arrive in Australia in the next couple of weeks. That'll be interesting. Well, in Canberra this week to check, check up on BAE's Australian operations is the Global Chairman, Sir Roger Carr. Well, Sir Roger, I should add, has also been chairman of companies like Cadbury, Chubb, Thames Water, and he's been president of the British peak business body, the CBI. No wonder, for his sins, he's been asked by the Prime Minister, Theresa May, to lead her Brexit Advisory Council for Industry, Infrastructure and Manufacturing. I caught up with Sir Roger a little bit earlier. So Roger Carr, great to have you in Australia and I guess happy 65th uh, birthday. I wanted to ask about the Hunter Class mandate. Just how significant is this mandate for BAE globally? It's huge. I mean, we have very deep foundations here, as you know, over the 65 years. But, but the Hunter Class order creates a long-term future for capability, for investment, for the country and our deep involvement in it. So material, material commitment on which we will build in the interests of Australia and indeed our company. We've spoken to Gabby Costigan, who runs BAE Australia here. How are you seeing the Hunter Class project uh, running to schedule at the moment? Well, I think the negotiations have proceeded well. I mean, we've, we've seen, I think, the right kind of negotiation where people are truly seeking a win-win because they see this as a partnership rather than a transaction. So, so far, so good on negotiation. We're at the final stages. We're hoping to see contract within the next few weeks. So maybe before Christmas? Well, we're hoping before Christmas because the sooner we can get the contract, the sooner we can get on with the job of building the ship. And that's really our main objective now. We have a good plan. We have resources in place. We're looking forward to the build and the design and development phase, which starts early next year. 
I see Canada has now given you the green light as well. So you're now building in Britain, Australia, Canada. Uh, can you get New Zealand as well, get four out of five eyes? Listen, we'd be delighted to take an order from New Zealand. I think the Five Eyes connection, the point you made, is absolutely right, Tiggy. I mean, there's a connection there which is vital to the world intelligence and our position in the world. Having a ship that is common to all, where there's infrastructure and technology common to all, will be helpful to the exchange of information and therefore the preservation of our security. Sir Roger, were you uh, surprised at uh, the Minister Steve Chobo's comments today uh, when asked about a possible change of leader or change of government, which, which might indeed happen, that it could lead to quite a lot of disruption in the sector? Well, I, I didn't quite hear that. What I heard today was there is absolutely an, an across-the-board commitment to the principle of this ship and the defence in general. I think what he was saying to me was, look, this is all driven by economy. I mean, if the economy is strong, if the revenues are there, then investment can be made. The pressure comes on all governments when economies start to stutter. So we've got to believe that the economy of Australia, which is so strong, continues in that direction. Therefore, the funding, not only for defence, but for everything else Australia needs, will continue to be there. I think there is conviction and commitment to defence. It's, it's a very important part of the future of this country in what is now an increasingly challenging world. Well, let me take you to our increasingly uh, challenged world and in particular the Pacific region. What is at stake uh, for Australia? Well, I think Australia itself has become, you know, a country which is both admired and in some cases recognised to be a very strong economic power and that always increases jealousy. In the region you are in, you're dealing with some very, very strong economic powers that are growing all the time, both in economic performance and military capability. They are countries that are good trading partners, but they're also countries that we have to recognize are people with their own ambitions and agendas. Therefore, protecting ourselves from the threats of others is something that we must do as a nation for the people of Australia. And I think that's where we are at the moment. I mean, specifically, China's growing influence in the region. I mean, sign, signing up uh, MOUs for its Belt and Road with a lot of Pacific Island nations. Do you think Australia's been perhaps a bit of a boiled frog on this issue? No, I listen. I think I think China is an extremely powerful force. With economic power comes military power. That is the history of all countries. We cannot ignore that. But Australia. I think is also a strong, although smaller, economic power, which is working hard now to create a sovereign capability in defence. It is the right time to do that, and it has to be done, I think, with real commitment, because we are in a part of the world where the most of the world trade takes place, where there's engaging population, ever-increasing growth, and therefore the need to preserve stability. Those things, economic growth, stability, are vital for the whole of the world, and Australia is part of that model. Do you think Australia's initiative in the region now recently is, is enough? Uh, we've obviously got this naval base uh, now, idea on Manus Island. Uh, do you think uh, the position is the right one? I think we're seeing in Australia a real recognition that there's a job to be done, there's a belief that it's important, and there's commitment to doing it quickly with enthusiasm. Those three things working in partnership with people who can deliver the goods to provide the defence capability, I think is very, very evident now in Australia. We see real partnership, real determination and real commitment to the challenge. And so Roger, obviously chairing such a global company with BAE Systems, you'd be able to have a, a view on ANZUS. Uh, where are we with the, the ANZUS relationship? We hear from Donald Trump a lot about North Korea, less so about the Pacific. Uh, where are we and to what extent does the Pacific uh, make a difference? I think the Pacific is a vital region to everybody. I mean, it is where the world's trade is taking place and has to be protected and preserved at all costs. We're seeing President Trump having an impact, there's no question, on the defence of varying parts of the world. Certainly something in North Korea has happened, which was not happening before President Trump. In Europe, we're seeing now a greater commitment to spending 2% of GDP rather than relying for nothing on the protection of the United States. So President Trump 
in many, many areas is having a material impact. But preserving the quality of life in the Pacific and the economy of the Pacific and the peace in the Pacific is vital to us all. Playing into all of this, of course, we've got the trade tensions between the US and China. Obviously, we've got the G20 talks between Donald Trump and Xi Jinping at the, the weekend. How important are these negotiations to stability in the region? I think they're very important. I mean, you're, you're dealing with two of the most important people in the world today who have unbelievable power in what they can and can't create. I think you're also, of course, dealing with people who understand the need for trade to continue, albeit maybe on slightly different terms, the need for peace to continue, for without that, nobody is a winner. So I'm hoping they'll approach it with a positive mindset, recognizing that Christmas is not far away. I wanted to ask you about this concept of sovereign capability, which uh, seems to be becoming so important in terms of winning a major contract. Do you think Australia has the right approach? Oh, yes. I think it is the approach that's being adopted now almost wherever you go in the world. I mean, nobody wants to be dependent on anybody else. You can have partnerships, you can enjoy the partnership of skill sharing, but at the end of the day, you want to have your own capability to build capability at home, to create jobs, to create opportunity, to have a sustainable capability. Australia is taking that approach, and I think it's the right one, and that's why we're very happy to work in partnership with Australia to deliver exactly that model. And you want 2% GDP, 2% GDP growing. Growing, 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 2% is a good start, but the growth of GDP is the most important thing of all. That's what enables commitment to be made and sustained by governments to projects. We've got two F-35s arriving in the next couple of weeks, and uh, BAE obviously has a role in servicing and in, and in manufacturing parts of it. We do indeed. I mean, we build, of course, in the United Kingdom, the whole of the tail section, so we're about 13% of every F-35. Importantly for Australia, we do actually machine some of the componentry, the titanium componentry, which is then shipped through to the UK, where it becomes part of the F-35 build. So we are linked internationally, but the product that you have bought F-35 is at least 13% BAE, and we're very proud of that. So we're now looking at the ADF fifth generation. What do we mean by that in terms of capability and superiority? And perhaps you could talk about it in the context of the next white paper. Well, I think, first of all, the, the fifth generation is a recognition that, that technology, more than anything, is driving change. Whether it's at the foot soldier level, with the way he's equipped, the equipment he's provided with, you know, levels of capability, communication, as well as firepower, that simply didn't exist five years ago, and that are evolving all the time. You can take that argument across all platforms. The platforms for delivery of firepower will change a little. What is inside the platform, the capability through lasers and sensors to be fearsome in firepower, is changing all the time. It is the evolution of that which is creating the fifth generation of capability. So what would you like to see in the next white paper? I think a, con a continued commitment, first of all, to the spending on defence, a recognition that we have to make sure we have people that are equipped in digital skills, in their basic education, so that we can fulfil what will be the ever-increasing demand in defence, which is people who can develop and manage technology. Technology has to be part of that white paper, but a commitment to a real defence capability is what we hope for. Lastly, can I ask you about Brexit with your Brexit hat on? Now, Prime Minister Theresa May has uh, made you chief of one of the most important councils, advisory councils, manufacturing and advisory. What do you think the chances are of her Brexit deal actually getting through the British Parliament? I think it's very dangerous to forecast anything in the current environment. I mean, it, it is clearly challenging. What are my views? I, the Prime Minister has shown actually a masterclass in resilience and determination to drive something through in seeking to please some of the people some of the time. She will never please all of the people all of the time because the views are so extreme. What she is offering, I think, for the vote is something that is not perfect, 
but offers a lot of the elements that the people of the United Kingdom voted for. They wanted near frictionless, frictionless trade, they didn't want to break up the United Kingdom, they wanted a control of their borders. This deal has that in it. There are parts of the deal that people find fundamentally unattractive, primarily the fact that it's difficult to leave the customs union by a vote in isolation. We need the approval of our partners. That's the tricky bit. That's the bit, I think, that will create the challenge in Parliament, and we shall see if the maths that are projected do actually create a problem for the Prime Minister. I, I hope that at the end of the day, calm heads will prevail, recognising that Europe has reached forward to create a solution which is not perfect for them, nor not perfect for us, but a solution we must find. Tumbling out with no agreement would be not good for us, or for anybody. Yes, I mean, BAE, of course, um, is now such a global company, perhaps not so exposed as some of the other big British based manufacturers. What do you make of these threats to just leave Britain? You know? I mean, you're absolutely right, because, you know, this is about the nation's interest, from my point of view, rather than the self interest. As a company, we're, we're affected very little by the outcome of Brexit. I, I think as a nation, we're affected materially. 44% of our traders with Europe, as you go through the supply chains into the small and medium-sized companies, you know, they, through the big companies, enjoy the kind of trading relationships that, frankly, give them wonderful access to growing markets. We've got to build on that. We've got to go into global markets with more enthusiasm, but an outcome which says no deal would, I think, be difficult for them. So finally, what do you make then of President Donald Trump, who just before he, he got on the plane this week said that the EU, he thought, had got a great deal, uh, but it would be quite difficult for Britain to trade outside the EU? I, I've never challenged the United States president at any time. He always has his own view. My own view is what we should try is to have the best of both preserve a good relationship with Europe, but push forward on a global level in all our export activity. That's the win-win solution for the British public. Sir Roger Carr, it has been great to be able to talk to you. Thank you so much for joining us, and as I say, happy birthday. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now let's go to the Royal Commission. ANZ box, uh, boss Shane Elliott and AMP's acting CEO Mike Wilkins took to the witness stand today as the Hain Royal Commission waged on in Melbourne. Your Money Chief Business Reporter Leo Shanahan was there on the ground. I got the latest news from him just a little earlier. Leo Shanahan, another big day starting with Mike Wilkins. He's a second day in the dock. How did he go? Well, I think in the, in the scheme of things for AMP, Tiki, not too badly. But, of course, this has really done as much damage short of closing the company down, I think, as it could have for AMP. So, yes, I think Mike Wilkins was diplomatic uh, in his final hour of hearings this morning. Uh, he, he, of course, yesterday uh, announced that the remediation program will go towards almost a billion dollars for... Uh, for AMP, about mm. 778 million, but that could still rise, uh, and that they are now urgently looking into their co their corporate super program as to whether that could be another fees for no service. Although they did release a statement today saying uh, they don't think that will uh, have a large effect on the company. Although you know we've heard all of this before, but uh, look, Mike Wilkins uh, is his second last day in the job. He did speak to the media after. Uh, the Royal Commission hearing today and uh, have, have a listen to this. AMP is a strong business filled with dedicated people who are already working very hard to address the matters that have been raised. I want to assure all of our customers that we're committed to earning back your trust. We know that it's going to take time but we'll work hard every day to re-earn that trust. I also note that today we've reconfirmed our review and remediation provision. We're committed to progressing that program and to making sure that our customers are compensated as quickly as possible. And finally, I also note that the corporate superannuation matter which is raised is under review but is unlikely to be material. Mm, well, uh, as I say, uh, you know, people wonder about AMP going forward. But in the meantime, we, of course, had ANZ CEO Shane Elliott uh, coming in for questioning. Uh, what did he have to say? 
Yeah, look, Shane Elliott's been an interesting one the last couple of years, trying his best to be the good cop, of, as I put it, in the, uh, in the routine between uh, regulators, the public, politicians and the banks. And uh, it may have paid off for him to some degree today. I think Tiki and his... The line of questioning uh, hasn't been too difficult, hasn't been easy from Rowena Orr. He's been asked uh, a lot about how long it takes for ANZ to report its failures. Uh, it takes, on average, longer than any other bank, uh, mm. almost four years, more than four years, it should be said, uh, to detect failures, another 150 days uh, to report those failures to ASIC, and then another 150-plus uh, to start remediating customers. And he was asked why this takes so long. Uh, he didn't have a great answer, and it especially didn't look good that it showed up in an internal report that uh, uh, ANZ employees viewed this as a, a, as a distraction, having to pay back customers. But uh, have a listen to Shane Elliott earlier on this. What happened at ANZ that led to it treating remediation of its customers for errors that ANZ had made as a distraction? So I think that that's a very totally fair question. I, I think I need to put this document into perspective and give it some context. Yes. This is not an official document of the group. It, it, it had essentially no shelf space, space or, or life to it. As we were developing our new approach to remediation and pulling together a team of people that would be dedicated to this, one of our mid-level, well, in our parlance, a group three executive, a, a you know, mid-level executive, uh, took it on their own to put down some thoughts uh, on their observations around remediation. So this was to be shared with the now head of that tribe or that group. As I said, it's not an official analysis. It's a person's perspective. It's a valid perspective, yes, but that's what it is. And I think that's important to note. So Shane Elliott there, he was also very keen to uh, emphasise some of the notional good, I suppose, that uh, ANZ is trying to do in the community, mitigate some of the poorer effects uh, that banking products have had on, the, on, on society. He, uh, he mentioned the use of a credit card uh, under questioning by Rowena Orr that now under new rules ANZ will cut off 80% cap of any credit card that's being used for online gambling. So basically you can't use the full extent uh, of that credit card for online gambling and um, this is what Shane Elliott said about that. When you're using a credit card essentially that's the bank's credit provision, and we do have a responsibility there. And we used a simple analogy to think about this as if we were running a, a bar. There is a responsibility not to serve people. People can buy alcohol, but at some point, not if they're intoxicated. And we tried to apply those principles here to provide some level of protection to customers so that they would not get themselves in harm's way by using our products perhaps irresponsibly. Right, and uh, Leo, what is left? We've got two more days till they wrap up. Yes, well, it might not even run for another two more days, Tiki. We've got, uh, we've got the chairman of Bendigo and Adelaide Bank uh, likely to give evidence tomorrow once uh, Shane Elliott's finished and then moves into uh, APRA's Wayne Bias. And uh, that will be that. I mean, his, his testimony could be quite long, uh, mm. given his role. Uh, but, uh, yes, it will be very interesting to see what Wayne Byers has to say for himself after all of this. It sure will. Well, Leo Shanahan, thank you very much for being down there this week. Thanks, Diggy. After the break, an interesting day for Afterpay to be mentioned in ASIC's Buy Now Pay Later review. Given its AGM was also today, we'll get more from Executive Chairman Anthony Eisen next. You're watching Tiki on Your Money. Now, back to Tiki. Welcome back. Well, Afterpay is defending its payment structure following an asset report into the buy now, pay later industry, which found Australian customers collectively owe $903 million in buy now, pay later debts. The company is stating that it should not be viewed as a typical credit provider since it doesn't charge consumers for providing credit. The company also had its AGM today in Melbourne, and I spoke to Executive Chairman Anthony Eisen on the sidelines a little earlier. Anthony Eisen, very nice to talk to you there. Now, uh, you've been behind closed doors today with your AGM. I'm just wondering uh, what happened in there, because uh, your share price went up quite a lot and then was pared back quite suddenly just after midday. I'm just wondering what went on. 
Look, we've had a really good AGM. I thought we had an excellent discussion with shareholders and they asked some very good questions. Um, from our perspective, um, our AGM was very informative and we're able to update shareholders on all of our activities, which we um, perceived as being very positive growth, particularly since our year end. Um, and shareholders seem to appreciate that update. OK, well, it's obviously a big growth story after pay. Uh, but I'm just wondering, what, what do you think paired the share price back? Was it the ASIC review or, or what? Look, we haven't been following the share price moment to moment. You know, our job is really to try and develop the company for the long term. Um, in terms of the very recent developments, the feedback we've gotten has been um, resoundingly positive um, and consistent with a lot of... Uh, the information that people were presuming around the buy now, pay, to, pay later review, um, but also the efforts we've been making as a company around continuous improvement um, and positive engagement, I believe, with ASIC and also other stakeholders. So um, the feedback we got today was um, that a lot of the information um, was, was well received um, and it represents the continuation of our journey and our engagement. What do you think the next step is for the regulator ASIC as far as your business is concerned? Look, I can't really speak for ASIC in terms of next steps, but, you know, um, my presumption would be that we just continue to engage with ASIC and other stakeholders. I think that what they made very clear was that um, they supported product intervention powers as a way to keep monitoring the industry going forward. Um, as you may be aware, we're a proponent of that stance um, and we made various submissions supporting that view that ASIC should have um, you know, regulatory oversight of Afterpay and other players in the industry in that way. So from us, it would be a, absolutely about continuing our positive engagement um, and making sure we keep describing the differences in our business and why actually Afterpay is different not only just to traditional credit, but other people in the buy now, pay later industry. Now, you say uh, you support this idea of, of ASIC's product intervention where, where it feels it's necessary. I'm just wondering about what ASIC was saying, that uh, it may be that buy now, uh, pay later businesses might be uh, required to be included in the, in, under the National Credit Act. Uh, now, they haven't made up their mind yet, but uh, are you concerned that Afterpay might be pulled into this sort of group? We, we feel very strongly and very good about um, the way Afterpay is different to traditional credit products and also other buy now, later providers. Um, I think what we've been able to illustrate both to ASIC and the broader public is as a company we've kept evolving our processes and our systems and have generated on the whole very large um, positive outcomes for customers generally. Um, we do recognise as a company and we're fully committed to continuously improving um, and listening to feedback, whether it's from ASIC um, or any other constituent um, that's relevant to our service and our product um, and can keep adjusting and making sure that we're committed to that improvement program. So. For us, it really feels like it's a continuation. We feel good about where we've gotten up to to date and we feel even better about other things that we can keep doing positively in the future. So for us, it really is about continuous engagement, um, but we feel positive that we've got um, the system, the people and the processes to keep adapting in a positive way. But you wouldn't want to be pulled into that, would you, the National Credit Act, because you'd have to then uh, do responsible lending checks on consumers, wouldn't you? I think, um, I think absolutely, from our perspective, we will do all things necessary to protect our customers um, and the way that they enjoy the service. I think for us, as I said before, it's really engaging around how people are using our product and our service and what are the right protections to put in place. Um, a lot of the traditional legislation didn't contemplate products like Afterpay and other innovative financial 
services products. So I think it is a bit more of a nuanced discussion, but it's one that we're very keen and eager to have. Well, you say in your response to the asset review that uh, you don't want people to pay late fees um, <clears throat> or commit more than they can actually pay, and that 93% of afterpay after orders are, uh, have no late fees, 75% of customers incurred no late fees. Uh, but aren't late fees actually a big part of your business model? Uh, absolutely not. So I couldn't be clear on this point. Our business model is about trying to champion the customer and offering them a bona fide free service. Um, we do and we aim to make the majority of our income from the retailers as opposed to the customer. Um, as it relates to late fees specifically, I think it's very important to understand that Afterpay loses more than what it collects. Um, and we don't seek to profit from late fees. And therefore that comes out in very different behaviours about how we interact with our customers. Um, so our goal is absolutely to drive late fees lower because generally late fees are a precursor to default. But I am pleased that Afterpay has managed to achieve one of the lowest default rates in the industry um, and substantially less than most other traditional players and new players, which illustrates that commitment to customers. Um, but we will keep driving in that direction. But it's absolutely not about profiting from late fees. Anthony, your growth has been astronomic. Are you expecting that growth to continue both here and in new markets like Great Britain? Yes, we are. I mean, the most um, pleasing aspect of our journey to date has been the way customers and retailers have responded to Afterpay, how they put their trust in our product. It's the simplicity, the transparency of our model and why we offer customers a bona fide free service that I think has attracted such a mind shift um, in the way Australians and then increasingly overseas consumers have warmed to our product. Um, we do think we can make a very big difference to both um, the way consumers pay and we align more with their modern day preferences away from more of those traditional credit forms and we know that we make a big difference to retail so we're really encouraged with the partnerships that we've established and um, we do feel that we do have a really good global opportunity. Finally, from uh, an investor's point of view, your shares have been very volatile, especially in, in recent weeks. Uh, going forward, you've got uh, well, the threat of rising interest rates. Uh, you've got uh, a Senate inquiry coming next year. How do you see uh, the stock going forward? Will it remain volatile or can you see uh, some sort of smoothing out? It's a good question, but I don't really think it's for me to answer that. Um, you know, as a, as a management team, we're purely focused on running the business um, and doing the right thing for our customers um, and our retail partners. I do feel very positive about the trajectory that we're on. Um, I think that our journey is still just beginning and we'll put all our efforts into um, extrapolating that benefit for shareholders in future periods. Um, so I think that's in our domain um, and how the markets respond to that from from moment to moment or day to day is, uh, is really difficult for us to determine. But all up, a very good AGM from your point of view? Nothing to report, anything like um, strikes or anything like that? <laughs> no, we were really pleased with it. Actually, the overwhelming response we had um, before and after the meeting from, from shareholders um, has frankly been inspiring. So as a team, we're energised. Um, we know that we're resonating so strongly with customers in Australia and around the world. So we're going to make the most of the opportunity. Anthony Eisen, thank you very much for your time there. Nice to talk. Thank you very much. Good night. I think the asset report was a bit better than they thought it might be. After the break, we'll get the latest in politics from Canberra with Sky News reporter James O'Doherty and what to expect from this week's G20 summit with former diplomat and managing director at ITS Global, Alan Oxley. This is Tiki on Your Money, covering the big business stories. Welcome back. Well, it is the question that everybody wants to know the answer to, isn't it? Just what will Donald Trump do when he meets Xi Jinping in Argentina at the weekend with this G20 summit in Buenos Aires? Well, uh, all sorts of people have all sorts of different views, uh, but I spoke to former diplomat and managing director at ITS Global, Alan Oxley, and he's not that optimistic. 
Alan Oxley, we're literally a couple of days away from the big G20 meeting. What are we to expect, do you think? Well, about two weeks ago, uh, there's some really quite exciting news. It was reported that uh, President Trump's key advisor, Mnuchin, who's the Treasury Secretary, would be meeting with Vice Premier Liu, who is Xi's leading um, economic analyst and advisor. And the fact that they're going to get together and meet, they had met several times already. They had several serious pieces of times of discussions about where things would go. And then every now and again, it, the switch got turned off and Trump reverted back to his normal patterns. And unfortunately, we've just seen that. Uh, Trump has recently given, just today, given an interview to the Wall Street Journal, and he's back to where he was about threatening bigger changes and more changes. So I think uh, he's still gaming, and I don't think we'll see anything significant at the G20 meeting. Really, you don't think that is sort of part of his art of the deal so that he can just sort of suddenly come good, uh, uh, capture some sort of big announcement and uh, make it all go away for us all? No, because the, the Chinese won't do that. Uh, you need to be certain that the Chinese will only engage with him when they're satisfied that there's a proper negotiation to take place. And uh, his utterances certainly don't make that qualification. So if that's right and there is no deal and, and no uh, hint, sniff of a deal uh, at G20, where are we going now with the next level of um, tariffs? Well, Trump, of course, is always a big talker. He's, he's in this Wall Street Journal piece, which has just been released today. He said he'll put more on if necessary. And that's been his style and manner all the way through. If we, if we go back and use the negotiations with the Mexicans and the Canadians as an example, he held off, held off, held off, held off for as long as he could. And then finally, when he is ready, then the negotiations began. The signal he's sending right now is that he's not ready. And if he thinks, I think, if he thinks that he can do something amiable with the Chinese uh, pr uh, president, uh, he's got that wrong too. Right. OK. So when you say hold off and you're comparing it to the, the NAFTA or whatever they're called now, negotiations, um, you, yeah. you, you actually mean that what, maybe New Year's Eve, because January 1, isn't it, is when the next level of, um, of ta tariffs come, come in from the American side? Well, that's, that's the, the Trump model and plan, yes. So uh, I guess we'll just have to wait to see. But uh, the Chinese aren't to be underestimated. Uh, they, in fact, at some point uh, during the final, uh, the, the big annual conference, which they have every year at uh, Hainan Island, it was about April, the president announced that they'd taken some action, and one of which was to cease the pressure on investors to hand over IT. And uh, Trump never responded to that. He's never actually said a crossword directly to the president. He's got a sort of strange relationship with President, uh, President Z. Okay. But on the other hand, uh, his whole model is that uh, there's no point trying to engage with him until he actually considers it's time to move. And I think the Chinese will sit, sit pat. I mean, the interesting thing is how long can this run? Analysts are saying they think that in about two years' time, the economies of both those countries are going to turn. So if Trump thinks it's going to take two years to do this, maybe that's what's in his head. Right. So in the meantime, within those two years, is there one for some people, some, some analysts do suggest that America uh, is going to be hurt more than China by these moves. Do you agree with that? And what, what industries will most likely be impacted uh, the most? Well, the first thing is that the, the number of industries affected is actually quite small as a share of the total US, uh, US economy. And while they're feeling the heat, uh, most American business is very happy with what's going on. You've got very good statistics for growth in the Chinese economy. Yeah. So what we don't really see from this end is the fact that the Chinese, that the U.S. companies affected and those who are doing, doing a lot of business in China actually only generate quite a small share of, of U.S. growth. But if this, so expands, hurting, if this expands, won't it be greater? Um, I suspect not because the areas that he's focused on are, are reasonably narrow in terms of, of what affects American trade. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly, he's starting to do things which are going to start to hurt. Uh, he's only going to be able to hold off his agricultural sector for a sort of period. He's put several billion dollars into the agriculture community, keep them happy because of all the bans he's put on exports of U.S. agricultural products to China, soybeans in particular for the pork industry. Uh, they will hold out for a year, 
But I saw a report yesterday which said that there'd be no more after that from one, one of the advisors. So it's, it's, he's, he's gaming here, but from, from the standpoint of the economic numbers in the US, uh, he considers he can afford to do it. Already we're starting to see some pain. There's an interesting interview with General Motors today mm. where they've announced they're going to close down one of their big plants. Uh, he's sort of saying to them, well, you can't really do that. I think you'll find out they can. Right. But, you know, he will, he, will, he will put up with that, is what you're saying. And uh, we'll all have to continue to watch this game of poker. And we've got economists pointing out that in the longer run, the sorts of things he's doing are actually going to backfire and harm the US economy. But that, that won't be apparent for two to three years. Mm. Very interesting. Well, we will see this weekend what eventuates. Alan Oxley, thank you so much for bringing us up to speed. Pleasure. One thing we do know so far, and that is that the Prime Minister won't have a formal bilateral meeting with the US President at the upcoming G20 summit. A spokesperson for Scott Morrison says there's no need for the formal meeting because he had extensive talks with Mike Pence on the sidelines of APEC. Well, let's go live to Sky News political reporter James O'Doherty. So, James, hi there. The government says the relationship is well managed. Uh, is that right? Well, yes, it is, Tiki. Uh, good evening. But the fact is, Scott Morrison would have wanted to have one of these formal bilateral meetings with uh, the US President Donald Trump when he meets or goes to the G20 in Argentina and all the pomp and ceremony that goes of around course. these formal bilateral meetings. You'd know that Scott Morrison hasn't had one of these meetings with the US President. They have spoken on the phone, but because the President didn't go to APEC, he uh, didn't have a chance to meet with Scott Morrison there. Scott Morrison instead meeting with Vice President Pence. Now I understand that Scott Morrison spoke with Vice President Pence for some time and the pair got on. They both have a fairly similar outlook on life. But ultimately, though, Scott Morrison would have wanted to have one of these meetings with mm. uh, the US President. Well, it could be now, his only chance. I mean, if he doesn't... If, the Prime Minister. If, if, yeah, if he doesn't get back in, uh, well, exactly right. in May or whenever. No, it's no, it's earlier than that. Now it's April, isn't it? Or oh, who knows when it is? Um, uh, yeah, it maybe his only chance to have a meeting with the the, pre the president. That's right, because a lot of these meetings uh, take place in what's known as summit season, which is, of course, the latter half of the year, the October to November, which is when all of these leaders essentially block out two months of the year to go and and go, go around the world to these various summits. Now, look, you'd think that the, uh, the current government is looking to uh, get uh, one of these uh, visits to the U.S. Uh, underway, although would, you'd remember that Malcolm Turnbull was only in the U.S. fairly recently, so that might take some time too. So you'd think that there wouldn't be a chance to have a meeting before the next election, and then ultimately it's up to the Australian people whether Scott Morrison gets back in to have that meeting. Look, a spokesperson for the PM is trying to spin this. Today they have told Sky News that the PM will no doubt have the opportunity to touch base with the President during the G20 meetings but given we have no pressing bilateral issues at the moment, the PM and the PM had an extensive opportunity with VP Pence. There is no pressing need for a formal bilateral at this stage. The relationship is being well managed. So Scott Morrison will try to have what's called a pull aside with mm. the US president where they see on the sidelines pull aside have a quick chat no formal meeting though and whilst there might not be any pressing bilateral issues it is of course the the growing regional concern of the influence of China in the region and how exactly the US plans to manage that yeah. trade war with China that Scott Morrison would have wanted to talk about OK, now, meanwhile, back at home, uh, there seems to be a little bit more fallout to uh, the, the latest Liberal that's, uh, that's fallen by the wayside. Yes, that's right. Julia Banks' decision to defect from the government it means the government is now down another vote in the House of Representatives. And it means things like a potential referral for Peter Dutton to the High Court could be more likely if Julia Banks wanted to support mm. that. Now, Labor hasn't ruled out mounting a referral for uh, Peter Dutton, but they say he should be referring himself. Now, speaking to the media here in Canberra today, Julie Bishop, former Deputy Liberal Leader, seemed to support that Labor view. This is a matter for each member to consider their circumstances and satisfy themselves and their electorate that they are eligible to sit in the Parliament. That's not a no. That's my answer. Isn't if Labor great? moves that referral, the government is saying, Dickie, that they will refer a number of other coalition MPs, or a number of other MPs, including Labor MPs, yeah. to the High Court as well. Yeah.
Don't you love Julie Bishop jumping in there? Uh, all right, James and Dirty, we'll see what happens after the weekend. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, Dickie. Well, now, after the break, we'll get across today's company news with Adam Dawes from Shaw & Partners next. Now, back to Tiki. Yeah, welcome back. Well, let's finish with a market wrap. The ASX closed down marginally lower today, sliding less than 0.1%. For more on today's movers and shakers, Adam Dawes from Shaw and Partners joins me live from Sydney. Adam, good day there. Can I ask you first about Afterpay? Because I did ask Anthony Eisen what he made of the uh, bit of a fall in the share price or correction in the middle of the day. What did the market make of it? Yeah, well, you, you, I think you rightly pointed out that it was sharply higher. I think 14.30 was, or 14.29 was mm. the actual high, but then just, uh, well, it closed uh, about a dollar cheaper or a dollar less. So, yeah, there was a, a big reversal through that intraday and, and basically squarely in front of what that AGM uh, and, and talking about what happened in that AGM. Tiki, they didn't really talk about the outlook, and I, I did scour the AGM twice to sort of get a bit of a uh -huh. feel for outlook, but there was really no commentary there. So that sort of, I think, is what the market was looking for, and we always do look for these AGMs for a bit more of a clarity about where they're sort of taking the business over the next six months or so, but there was nothing to that effect. Though they did have a very interesting chart in there talking about the net uh, trust score. The big banks uh, scored the lowest, but retail sh or retailers uh, scored the highest. And that's certainly where the, uh, Afterpay is firmly, squarely in the, in the sights of that retail market. Right, OK. Well, that is interesting because I asked him about, a little bit about growth and he said growth's going to continue in all directions, he thought. Uh, but no, no, no more sort of specific on Outlook. That was the issue, you reckon? Yeah, maybe. I mean, you know, it, it's all about the U.S. growth, and really, it doesn't really matter. I mean, if, if U.S. starts to take off, it really doesn't matter what happens here in Australia because it will be dwarfed by, yeah. by the numbers of what can happen in the U.S. as well. So, look, mm -hmm. a little bit of growth here, and certainly the ASIC uh, findings today definitely put a bit of a, a dampener on, on the share price because this, mm -hmm. this stock definitely moves 8 to 10% of the day up or down. So, yeah. yeah yeah, it, it de definitely put that on. But some of the numbers that they came out with ASIC were very, very interesting as far as that. Um, the, the review uh, found that, that their volume has increased fivefold from around about 400,000 transactions in 15, 16 to now uh, around about 2 million transactions for, two, uh, for 2017 wow. and 18. And it certainly looked at also that um, the absolute number of uh, the, or the, the, the size of those transactions have, have moved greatly. But one of the interesting things that they did say about this was that 60% uh, of those buy now, pay later users are now between 18 and 34, so squarely mm. that millennial. But really, 40% uh, of those uh, have earnings under $40,000. Now, yes. Tiki, that doesn't leave a lot of room for any mistakes yes. or mishaps if you've, got a, if you've got a debt and then you lose your job. Uh, so that is a big concern for ASIC at the moment. Yeah, I saw the Daily Telly today saying that it was still, it's almost snitching from, uh, from deposits, from first owned by deposits for millennials. So it, but very interesting. Now, look, let's move back right. to, speaking of uh, trust factor, the, the bigger banks and bigger side of things. Of course, AMP, we had Mike Wilkins there yeah. uh, in the stand. Uh, what do we think uh, is uh, his uh, announcement about yet another internal inquiry? Well, this is why we haven't been buying this story and we've still firmly got to sell on the stock. It's, it's basically that they've come out and said remediation is now going to be around about $778 million. They, they expected that to be a little bit higher, but that's what now that it's come in at. Um, mm. The stock actually hit an all-time low or close to its all-time low of $2.28 today. Uh, so, yeah, um, and it bounced a little bit off, off that low. But, yeah, it, it's something that I think at, at, at the moment it's, it's very tough for AMP and we've still got some more grey clouds around AMP. We've still got the end of the, um, end of the uh, Royal Commission coming up in February and then really what is going to happen with it. Uh, do they need to split what is going to happen or how is that business going to look? So, mm -hmm. yeah, there's still a fair bit of water underneath the bridge before you'd be looking to investing in AMP at the moment. And what's the market make of the new fellow who's about to start, Francesca de Ferrero? Only time will tell. I mean, he's got some pedigree, yeah. but uh, only time will tell. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. What do you think, Tiki? Well, 
look, he came from Credit Suisse, which is my old shop, which has got to be good for starters. Uh, but no, look, I'm yeah. with you. I think yeah. it, uh, it, it's a very, and gosh, it's a very interesting time from his point of view to start. He's got it uh, all his work cut up for him, hasn't he? Absolutely. Very, <laughs> right. very big workload. <laughs> all right, Adam Dawes, it's great to talk to you. Thanks so much for joining us there. Thanks, you. Have a great night. And that is all for the show tonight. Look, you can watch us again at 10 p.m. on Free to Air Channel 95 or on Foxtel Channel 601. It's a great time, I think. Tomorrow night, Linus CEO Amanda Lacar is live on the show to tell us the latest upshot from a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Malaysian Prime Minister Dr. Mahathir. Thanks for your company.